Good evening. I'm Sam Roberts, and welcome to Virtually Live from Federal Hall. This is our second program in our fall series of Debate Defends Democracy. It's presented by the National Parks of New York Harbor Conservancy in partnership with New York University and the National Park Service. This series is generously supported by the Carnegie Corporation of New York with additional gifts from the Stonebelly Family Foundation and the Bogosian Quigley Family Foundation. I'm a New York Times reporter and history advisor to Federal Hall, which is on Wall Street in New York City. Debate Defends Democracy seeks to open minds, to provide critical historical context to current issues. The legacy of what our founders did at Federal Hall during the 531 days when New York City was the nation's first capital from 1789 to 1790, and the people and issues they neglected reverberate in so many of the challenges America faces today. The Conservancy's goal is to transform Federal Hall from a majestic but neglected monument into a living catalyst for civic and civil engagement. This session's potent and timely topic is the Supreme Court and balancing power. That balance has already shifted even before the November election. The court began a new session without Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg for the first time in 27 years. We'll explore the evolving impact of partisanship and how the nomination of a new justice and perhaps a new president may impact the court's ideological balance. We've come a long way since the first Congress convened at Federal Hall and passed the Judiciary Act, which empowered George Washington as the first president to fill every federal judicial vacancy. I'm pleased to turn over the program to our esteemed moderator, WNYC Jamie Floyd. You'll recognize her as the voice of the local host of All Things Considered, She's also the legal editor in the WNYC newsroom. She's been covering the court for many years, and she actually began her career in journalism after getting a law degree from Berkeley Law School and teaching at Stanford Law School. Over the past two decades, she's reported for ABC News, CBS, Court TV, appeared as a legal and political analyst on many news outlets, including CNN, Fox News, NBC, MSNBC, and PBS. She'll moderate tonight's panel and introduce our distinguished guests. Please welcome Jamie Floyd. Thank you, Sam, so much for that introduction. It's always quite something to see your life flash before your eyes uh, when receiving such uh, a terrifically uh, descriptive introduction of one's <laughs> professional life. Uh, and I wanna thank you also, Sam and Federal Hall, as well as our partners, including NYU, for this great privilege to continue in my ongoing role as your moderator for the fall series of Debate Defends Democracy, uh, a critically important series uh, at this time in our uh, American history. And, you know, despite everything else that is going on in the world uh, and in the White House, uh, it is October. And as Sam indicates, that means the Supreme Court started its new term yesterday, the first month of the, the first Monday of the month of October. And so uh, it is time for us to dig in. And I, I think it is lost on no one. This is the first time in almost 30 years that the term starts without Justice Ginsburg on the bench. We also have a rush to confirm President Trump's nominee, Amy Coney Barrett. That's still on despite all of the news of this week. And there was a decision recently about electors from the Electoral College that said they're not bound to vote for a winning candidate who then dies. So we're gonna talk about all of that. And now I'd like to welcome our accomplished and distinguished panel to talk about a few of the cases of last term and perhaps as significantly or more significantly what we can expect this term. Trevor Morrison is Dean of NYU School of Law and co-director of the Reese 
Center on Law and Security at NYU Law School. It's a pleasure to have Dean Morrison with us as an expert of constitutional law as practiced in the executive branch. He actually spent a year there as the White House Associate Counsel to President Obama, and his research focuses on the separation of powers, federalism, and the federal courts. Who better to have with us today and tonight? He has firsthand experience also with the inner workings of the Supreme Court from his years as a law clerk to Justice Ginsburg. Welcome, Dean, tonight. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you. Happy to be here. Also joining us is Ilya Shapiro, director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute. Mr. Shapiro has a great deal of firsthand court experience as well. He has filed more than 300 hundred amicus or friend of the court briefs in the Supreme Court. And, you know, we can ask you, Ilya, later whether it's amicus or amicus. That's a big debate amongst lawyers. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, before entering private practice, he clerked for Judge E. Grady Jolly of the U.S. Court of Appeals. That's in the Fifth Circuit. He also has a prolific conservative thought leader and writing uh, background. He's a publisher for the Cato Supreme Court Review and has edited 11 volumes there. He also has a book that's just out. It's called Supreme Disorder, Judicial Nominations and Politics of America's Highest Court. Just in the nick of time, he joins us tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Probably more libertarian than conservative. I'll, I'll take classical liberal. I like that title. And uh, what is it, amicus or amicus? Uh, I use either. The more controversial is the plural, where I use the old Latin amici rather than amici. Ah, I like a good uh, classic scholar in our midst. All right. And it is my pleasure to welcome my friend, Janae Nelson. She's the Associate Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. That's America's premier legal organization fighting for racial justice. Not that anyone really needs to be told that. Ms. Nelson is on the front lines of advocacy and works with the president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund Strategic Vision and oversees the operation of its programs. She's also a member of Legal Defense Fund's litigation and policy teams and was one of the league counsel on federal challenges to Texas voter ID laws. She's also a former professor of law. She's testified before Congress on voter suppression, algorithmic bias, and in support of Voting Rights Advancement Act. We are here, we are glad to have you here, Janae, with us. And I wanna say to all of our panelists that I want this to be more of a conversation, though I, I would bet it will be a feisty one. Uh, and I want to encourage our audience to post questions to the Zoom Q&A chat function. We're going to get to as many as we can a bit later in the program. Uh, I want to start, maybe if we we don't mind, panel, with a couple of procedural questions in light of the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. Now that two of the senators on the Judiciary Committee uh, have tested positive for COVID. Um, and I guess I'll come to you first, Dean Morrison, as our dean in our midst, but also someone who understands the inner workings of these things. Um, we've got a couple of committee members who are sick. I understand that they don't have to be. Let's take the first things first for the Judiciary Committee hearing. They don't have to be president. It sounds that they can. Sounds as though they can have the hearing much as you can have your class remotely. Uh, is that right? That's right. And hearings have been happening um, in both the Senate and the House uh, remotely since um, the, the general lockdown in the spring. So for purposes of the hearing, um, in-person participation not required. But I noticed your intonation there, suggesting that maybe when we get to the uh, moment of a vote on the floor of the Senate, we got to have people present, right? The rules require in-person voting? Yeah, the key moment, um, there, there may be a question about um, a quorum and in-person in participation within the committee, but the big question, uh, I think, is once we get to the floor of the Senate, uh, that voting cannot be done by proxy in the Senate. It must be done, and it can be done remotely. It must be done in person. 
Uh, there's quite a long history of sometimes very ill uh, senators being delivered to the Senate in order to cast a vote. Um, of course, if that were to happen with someone who was um, ill and also contagious, there would be a, a serious set of uh, questions to think through. Uh, and I'm sure that there are plenty of folks on the Hill right now thinking about all of that. I'm not a presidential historian, but there's something in my memory flickering about Andrew Johnson's impeachment and someone uh, being delivered to vote uh, to the floor, though he was on death's door. Am I right about that? That could be true. I don't know that detail. Uh, I could be wrong. It could be some other important vote. Maybe it was the Revolutionary War period, or maybe both. <laughs> could well be right. There have been tie-breaking votes cast by people who were um, very ill indeed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I also, I think maybe in the Revolutionary War period, there was someone who was on death's door and needed to cast a vote uh, for the for the declaration and also made it uh, to the chamber in time. So so let me ask you before I ask you the question we really want to get to uh, each of you, I'm going to ask for what one one you have to choose one. Uh, uh, your favorite, uh, favorite, can we talk about favorites when we're talking about Supreme Court jurisprudence? It seems a little disrespectful, but I want to know the one case that you would choose from last term uh, that would be the most significant in your view. But before we make that turn to jurisprudence, I would like to ask Janae and Ilya each if you want to weigh in on what you think will happen now to Judge Coney Barrett's nomination given the significant wrinkle posed by these COVID infections in the Judiciary uh, Committee chamber and quite potentially on, on the floor of the full full Senate. Uh, Ilya, first to you. I forgot we're on Zoom. We actually <laughs> right. tossed the baton. <laughs> right. Uh, well, uh, Ron Johnson, senator from Wisconsin, who is one of those who has tested positive, said today that he would uh, vote even if he had to wear a moon suit. So apparently they're thinking of, of things like that. It's unclear how sick these folks are. You know, President Trump obviously went to the hospital and had some difficulty breathing uh, Friday night. Uh, I haven't seen any indication of whether the, the senators either on the committee or Senator Johnson, how sick they are. The eventual Senate vote would be, we're looking at uh, probably the last week of October, so they could have recovered. A lot of a lot of ifs, uh, certainly. I, I'm certainly, I'm not going to bet against uh, Mitch McConnell trying to confirm judges. So if, if, if you're asking me, will she be confirmed? I think more likely than not. Hmm. Janae. Yeah, well, I'll say there, there's still a, a fair amount that can develop between now and the time of the vote. Uh, there's already this development that no one could have anticipated, and that is having senators have, con, you know, contracting COVID and, and throwing all of this process into disarray. One can certainly question whether it's even advisable to move forward with a hearing of this importance that's been shrouded in such controversy with any of the members in absentia for any part of it. So I think that one of the things that's critically important for uh, the Senate to think about is the integrity of the Supreme Court and how critical it is to our nation's checks and balances system and starting this process under the cloud of such uncertainty and controversy does not bode well for public confidence in this process. So that's something that we should be keeping in mind as we look to how this plays out over the next few weeks. And as I said, I imagine that uh, this will still take lots of twists and turns before we ultimately get to a decision on this nominee. All right, enough with the politics, let's get to the legal, the stuff we all crave. Uh, and Janae, since you uh, are holding the baton, why don't you kick this part of it off and let's talk about the last term, 2019 to 20. Uh, Give us one case that for you was hugely significant. Well, you, you already you already sort of took the legs out from under me because you said one case and, and I was going <laughs> to cheat. And uh, there, there are actually four cases, but I'll tell you how I can get four. through it. Four. Well, one is a consolidated trilogy of cases. So it's basically one case that's and that's fair. Bostick, Bostick versus Clayton County, Georgia, um, which is an excellent decision regarding the scope of Title VII. And the reason why that case is so important is uh, not only because it extends Title VII's protections against workplace discrimination to people who identify as LGBTQ, 
But it also gives a, a slight glimmer of hope to what was a devastating decision uh, just a few months earlier than the issuance of the Bostic decision. And that's a case called Comcast versus National Association of African-American Owned Media, where the court was interpreting uh, what the pleading requirements are under Section 1981 of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Uh, wow. Both of those cases dealt with the issue of causation, the Comcast case and the Bostock trilogy of cases. And uh, I can tell you that we watched that case so closely at the Legal Defense Fund because Section 1981 is such a critical piece of legislation in order to ensure economic parity uh, uh, across various groups in this country. It was originally enacted, as you as you know from the year, uh, during a period of reconstruction, and it was intended to ensure that African Americans had equal footing uh, uh, with whites to enter into contracts, to buy goods, to engage in economic transactions. And it has been used in a variety of settings. In this case, this had to do with uh, uh, the company owned by Byron Allen, a media personality, uh, having uh, seeking to have some of his programming distributed on the Comcast network. And there was uh, ample evidence to suggest that one of the reasons that they did not want to distribute his programming was because they did not want another African-American media mogul to emerge. Clearly discriminatory, clearly racially discriminatory. But the issue in that case was whether you had to prove but for causation when you were just pleading the case at its early stage. And the argument uh, from the part of Byron Allen and, and the association that he represented is that as long as it's a motivating factor, that should be enough to satisfy the standard under Section 1981. Comcast suggested that if they could provide a neutral reason for denying uh, the distribution rights, then that should overcome. Any, any potential claim that Byron Allen and, and the association could assert. Uh, fortunately, the, the court did not go as, as, as extreme as Comcast was leading it to uh, and suggested that but for a causation was certainly required, but it, it, didn't, it didn't close off the possibility that there can be one, there can be more than one uh, but for a cause. And we saw that play out uh, quite quite beautifully in the, the uh, Bostick cases where the court had an, uh, incredibly powerful language about how you prove but for causation, suggesting that it can be quite sweeping and expansive. And so those cases give me some hope um, as to how Section 1981 might be interpreted going forward and how that incredibly important uh, civil rights statute can still continue to do economic justice in this country in the, in, the, in the casing and packaging of another wonderful decision that extended civil rights protections to a community that has faced workplace discrimination uh, in the past and now has this, uh, now can, can, can rest uh, assured that Title VII can grant it some protection. All right, so so that was two cases, four wrapped into two, but you tied them together, so we'll allow it. The court will Thank allow you. it. Thank uh, <laughs> All right, <laughs> Ilya Shapiro, uh, what's, what's your most significant case of the 2019? Sure. Uh, I'm going to go with another civil rights case, uh, Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. Uh, this is a, an important educational freedom choice where Montana set up a uh, system of uh, scholarship uh, tuition uh, tax credits, that is, donors could donate to these scholarship organizations and take a, a tax credit off their state taxes for that, and then these uh, scholarship organizations would uh, give uh, money to parents of kids who wanted to attend, uh, well, any school uh, in the state. Uh, the problem is Montana is one of 37 states that has uh, what's colloquially known as a Blaine Amendment or a, or a no direct aid to religious organizations uh, provision in their state constitution. Uh, these were passed in the late uh, uh, 19th century during a period of anti-Catholic bigotry when the only alternative to the government schools was uh, Catholic schools. 
And uh, different states have interpreted them in different ways, whether through their legislatures or their judiciaries. But in Montana, uh, the Department of Revenue said that this tuition program, uh, scholarship program, violated that uh, Blaine Amendment in the state constitution. Uh, a few uh, uh, poorer families who wanted better opportunities for their kids, uh, led by Kendra Espinoza, uh, sued uh, the Montana Department of Revenue, and ultimately the Montana Supreme Court uh, threw out the entire program, saying that if we uh, uh, you know, delineate between religious and non-religious schools, then that'll, uh, th that's us rewriting the law. We'll send this back to the legislature. And then it went to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, which broke five to four and said that making uh, those kinds of decisions based on the religious status of the school altogether violates the First Amendment, and, and therefore uh, the, the program uh, is in effect, uh, and uh, the parents can choose to use that scholarship money uh, for any school, parochial, private, or, or otherwise. Uh, and this is the last remaining legal uh, federal constitutional barrier to the expansion of school choice, which of course is so important to uh, educational opportunity, particularly for minority communities. I, I find it interesting that you started out by saying uh, this was a civil rights case uh, as opposed to a case about religious freedom. Well, I, I think getting an educational opportunity, educational freedom, directing the, the upbringing of your kids is a, is a very important civil right. Hmm, fair enough. Uh, Trevor Morrison, your, your 2019 to 2020 case of the term. Citing Janae's precedent, I'm going to fudge this one case thing a little bit, um, and I'm going to pick three that are really two. Oh my goodness, the slippery slope has... <laughs> <laughs> Let the record reflect that I actually followed the direction. Yes, indeed you did. You yes. did. That's, that's disorienting, I must say, but uh, I'm, I'm going to press ahead anyway. Uh, so for me, a uh, very important set of cases are uh, involved... Uh, the power of two different bodies to subpoena information um, relevant to their proceedings and involving the president. Um, I'm thinking of the Mazars and Deutsche Bank cases, which involve uh, congressional subpoenas of third parties holding financial information relating to the president, um, namely his tax returns and other financial information. These are his accountants and bankers. Um, and then uh, Trump against Vance, which is a case involving the power of a state grand jury impaneled to hear uh, potential criminal charges to issue a similar uh, subpoena for the same kind of information, um, uh, Vance being the district attorney here in Manhattan. Um, in each of these cases, uh, the outcome was from the court was rather mixed. I should say the posture of, of each of these cases is not necessarily the way one would ordinarily expect the court to be drawn in to this kind of separation of powers uh, conflict on the one hand in the Mazars and Deutsche Bank cases, pitting Congress against the presidency um, and federalism in the, in the context of Vance against Trump, pitting um, state and local law enforcement authorities against the federal executive. The posture was odd because in each, it was uh, President Trump in his personal capacity and then supported by the Justice Department um, who invoked the power of the courts seeking to block uh, these subpoenas, right? So Congress issued these subpoenas to third parties um, uh, acting on behalf of the, of the grand jury, the district attorney's office was issuing subpoenas to third parties and the third parties were not seeking legal protection from the court in order to comply with these. Um, and Congress was not seeking the aid of the court in order to enforce compliance with these subpoenas. Rather, it was President Trump invoking uh, the power of the court and asking the court to block enforcement of these subpoenas. Ordinarily, well, ordinarily, there isn't litigation of this sort. Each of these was quite extraordinary, but one might expect that the question would be, can Congress, for example, invoke the power of the courts and get the courts on Congress's side, as it were, to enforce a congressional subpoena issued at a member of the executive branch, high-ranking member of the executive branch. That is an ongoing question in litigation in the DC Circuit, the United States Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit, involving McGahn, the former uh, White House counsel to, uh, to President Trump. And Don, the power there. Don, Don McGahn, who is. Um, exactly. Um, 
And the question in that, in, in those cases, which is in the DC circuit right now, it's, it's been decided at the panel level, gone up to the en banc level, the full DC circuit, then back to the panel on a number of different questions, included whether Congress even has standing or a congressional committee even has standing to invoke the power of the court to enforce uh, congressional subpoenas issued at uh, executive branch officers, either currently in their office or recently served executive branch officers. Um, and there, they're usually the executive branch would be in the posture of saying the court shouldn't get into this. The very unusual thing in the Trump against Mazar's case and the uh, Vance against Trump case is that it was the president himself who was asking the courts to get involved, to block these subpoenas, which surely otherwise would have been complied with. And the decisions that the court ultimately issued in each of the cases were sort of mixed. They did not um, say that this information has to be turned over right now to these congressional committees or to the state grand jury. Um, they suggested that in the Mazar's case that the lower court perhaps needed to weigh the competing interests, recognizing legitimate executive prerogative on the one hand and legitimate congressional legislative prerogative on the other hand, but perhaps they need to be weighed slightly differently um, than the Court of Appeals had done. There seemed to be a clear path forward for the uh, grand jury subpoena to be honored, although the case was sent back for further development rather than a direct order that the subpoenas be honored immediately. What was most important to me in all of these cases is that the most extreme arguments advanced by President Trump's personal lawyers and frankly by the Justice Department were rejected. That is that the court rejected by large majorities, seven to two, not identifiable simply on partisan lines, um, that any categorical immunity that the president might have from congressional bodies gaining access to this information was simply a misunderstanding of the law, that the president does not enjoy that kind of categorical immunity and certainly doesn't enjoy a categorical immunity that he can insist be enforced against third party subpoenas of this sort. Very difficult weighing legitimate interests on both sides in the separation of powers context and in the federalism context but I thought it very significant that the court recognized the legitimate law enforcement interest in the Vance case and the potentially legitimate congressional legislative interest that existed in Mazars and Deutsche Bank, and that it rejected the most aggressive, frankly, unprecedented and aggressive arguments of executive power being advanced in, in, in each of those three cases. I really enjoyed hearing uh, each of you select from such varied uh, areas of jurisprudence on the part of the court, which is why it's great to have a diverse panel. Um, and I'm sure the audience uh, did as well. Um, we spoke in our first of the series, um, I guess it was last week, about um, the history of the Supreme Court and the ways in which it started out at the beginning of the union, uh, given the, the context for this series, Federal Hall. Um, and, and, and so I want to come back uh, to you, Dean, uh, and, and the fact that you alluded there in that answer several times to how extraordinary uh, this series of cases, and, 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 and you, you uh, like uh, uh, Janae Nelson, uh, chose a, a, a group of cases, essentially consolidated cases. So, so it was within the, it was within the, the scope of the question, um, but extraordinary nonetheless, because really uh, how many times have we had presidents under subpoena make their way to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, whether they are petitioning or the party subpoenaing is petitioning? Uh, you know, there's been, there was the Jefferson uh, Burr uh, example at the beginning of our union. And then, of course, the famous or infamous, however you want to look at it, Nixon uh, example, the famous case that, that came down in the Nixon years. And then, of course, the Clinton the Clinton example, uh, e equally infamous or less infamous, but still it made law. And, and now here we are again. So I wanna ask you looking ahead now, turning to the next term, uh, we, we may have a court that has uh, four, uh, eight justices that could split four, four, or we may have a court that has a newly installed uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett and gives us a newly constituted Supreme Court as we think of it a newly constituted Supreme Court and could that mean then uh, Dean Morrison uh, a court that might make some decisions about the election itself let's talk about that before we get to uh, the cases that are on the docket what about cases that are not yet on the docket 
if she's confirmed, and President Trump has seemed to indicate that he is looking to her to uh, adjudicate some ballot questions, uh, is that a real possibility that she could be a part of cases that might arise over counting ballots, for example, I'm thinking of Bush v. Gore type cases, uh, or is this just media speculation and frankly speculation on the part of President Trump? Well, um, it's a good question. I think the way I would look at it is that the most speculative piece of it is um, that there would in fact end up being a case in front of the Supreme Court that would sort of consequentially decide the election in the way the Bush versus Gore case did as for the 2000 election. That is possible, but by no means assured. Um, will there be litigation of some form uh, arising out of events leading up to uh, and on election day? Absolutely. In fact, there already is plenty of litigation going on, addressing a number of questions with regard to early voting, et cetera, um, and, and mail-in voting. Um, you know, is it, I, I think it's easy to assume that because of the acrimony of our political environment, um, the unprecedented nature of trying to conduct a nationwide election like this in the midst of a pandemic, et cetera, uh, that and and frankly the um, doubt that the president has gone out of his way to cast on the election result even before it's known um, makes it, it can be easy to leap to the conclusion that this is going to end up in the Supreme Court and be resolved there. I I, I think that is far from inevitable. Mm. However, if the court does end up hearing any case uh, in touching the election in any way. Um, and if Judge Barrett is confirmed before then, then I think it is exceedingly likely that she will cast a vote in that case. Um, I, I see essentially no prospect that she would recuse herself from those cases. Um, as I understand it, in the absence of direct evidence that there was some kind of quid pro quo between <laughs> you know, the president and the nominee, and I see no reason to think that that's the case. Um, in the absence of something like that, the court's the typical approach to recusal would not require, you know, a judge to recuse, I don't think, in that sort of context. Um, so the greater uncertainty is whether the Supreme Court really will be the ultimate decider of the election. Um, I would say that if there is litigation that becomes decisive, I find quite unpersuasive the president's argument and the argument by some other senators that that therefore means that Judge Barrett must be confirmed. I don't take it for granted that every member of the court would simply decide that in that case, their vote was determined by the uh, political party of the president who nominated them. So I don't think it's inevitable that even if there were only an eight member court, court that it would divide four four. But if that happened, which is now speculation on top of speculation, the court has rules for how to deal with cases that are deadlocked four four. And that is to leave in place the decision of the court below. Um, and we have a, a responsible court system overall I dare say, I think that the justices would work rather hard to avoid a 4-4 deadlock, but if we did, it would be operation of law and not politics that would tell us what to do then. So it's, it's speculation and an expectation of political voting on the part of the justices that, that is the basis for the argument that we need to confirm someone now just to have a nine-member court to hear a case that may never come. All right, well, Ilya, your book is called Supreme Disorder. <laughs> Uh, what, yeah, the, the, the publisher had the publisher had to pay extra for for this particular timing. Um, <laughs> right. What do you think about all of that? I mean, I, I I appreciate what Dean Morrison is saying. We have a system. The courts are, uh, you know, we have a process. The courts we don't have to rush the process just to ensure that we have a nine member court to deal with any uh, decisions that may need to be made about the election. But but don't we? Huh. Well, I don't think I disagreed with anything that uh, Dean Morrison said. Um, if the court splits 4-4, then the, the, the lower court uh, ruling stands. And I'm not sure the loser or supporters of the loser in that scenario would find losing uh, in, if it's Pennsylvania, say, than the Third Circuit uh, to be uh, less satisfying or less legitimate than losing 5-4 to four at the Supreme Court, say. Um, so it's not a constitutional crisis. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that we need to confirm someone uh, just so that there are 
uh, nine justices on the court. Uh, but it's certainly unfortunate that both President Trump and uh, leaders, uh, certain leaders in the Democrats cast um, doubt on the uh, on the uh, election or say that it's rigged or that the, the, the whoever the loser is declared on election night should not concede right away, these sorts of things. We have such a low level of social trust that if the case gets to the Supreme Court under any scenario, whether it's an eight justice court that ends up five to three or eight nothing or four four, or whether it's a nine justice court, um, already the country will have lost just because there's going to be a, a lack of confidence uh, all around. Yeah. Yeah, Janae, I'd like to ask you, uh, Dean Morrison alluded to the, the the many lawsuits that have already been filed. Uh, there is, as uh, Ilya Shapiro just indicated, this lack of trust throughout the country. What are the issues around the election, around voting specifically, that are real, uh, as opposed to those that are imagined going into November 3rd, and I would imagine beyond. And I know we don't have uh, all night <laughs> to <laughs> educate ourselves about them, but give us just a, a sense of, of what's, what's happening out there, especially in the key states. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, I do wanna say with respect to uh, Judge, Judge Barrett's nomination, that it's true, I agree with what everyone uh, has said, that, that there's absolutely no need to rush the nomination uh, before the election, because a four-four court—I mean, a, a sorry, eight-person court can work. Four-four decisions um, have been issued many times, and it's important, as I said at the outset, that the public can have confidence in the integrity of the Supreme Court. And Dean Morrison is absolutely correct that uh, right now there doesn't appear to be any quid pro quo. Uh, and also, this raises an issue that justices on the Supreme Court aren't governed by the code of conduct that other federal judges are judged by that can force recusal in certain instances. But I would argue that even when recusal isn't mandated by a case law or by statute, that just the overall concept of the appearance of impropriety or the appearance of impartiality should encourage judges and justices to recuse themselves when there's some doubt about whether uh, their appointment was for a particular purpose. And I would argue that the circumstances surrounding the rush of this nomination and, and uh, uh, many of the controversial circumstances would cast doubt on the impartiality of a Justice Barrett. Um, that said, you know there are so many cases that are beyond this particular nominee for the president, this candidate for the president or, or any candidate for the president uh, that that really require our attention because they go to broader issues of our democracy. The Legal Defense Fund has been litigating cases in South Carolina, in Alabama, uh, in, in Florida, uh, across the South in response to, uh, one, the pandemic and the very real toll that it's taken on African-American and Latinx communities. Those communities are two times as likely to die from COVID and also three times as likely to contract it. And we can imagine in the midst of a pandemic and an all important election, there's a real concern about access to the ballot and the ability to cast a ballot in a safe and secure manner. So we have been fighting to uh, lessen some of the barriers for mail-in voting, to ensure that there's an equitable distribution of, of sites to collect ballots and that we are not forcing anyone to choose between their health and the fundamental right to vote. So there's a whole set of cases that we're working on along with many of our allies and colleagues uh, in the civil rights arena to ensure that we keep people safe during this election and we don't ask them to forfeit their right to vote. But there's also a very interesting case that's coming up um, that I'm happy to talk about now that is on the docket for this upcoming term that involves what is called ballot harvesting. I don't particularly care for that term. I think it's uh, a bit a bit partial, but I'll explain what it is. Um, it really is simply the process of third party collection of ballots uh, so that uh, it can enable a voter to cast his or her ballot. And there are about 10 states that allow third parties to cast and deliver the ballots of other voters. And there are about 20 states, including Arizona, that places 
you know, restrictions on it, if not an outright ban. Um, this term, the court just Friday agreed to hear a case involving the issue of whether individuals can collect ballots on behalf of others and turn them in to polling sites. Arizona also has a law that, that bans um, the counting of ballots that are cast at polling sites that are not the correct polling site for that voter. And, and that's an interesting concept because it may seem uh, uh, obvious that, well, if you cast your ballot in the wrong uh, precinct or at the wrong polling site, then perhaps that ballot is ineffective. But if we think about the fact that we're in a general election, we have a presidential election occurring. It doesn't really matter, at least with respect to national offices and statewide offices, it doesn't really matter where you cast your ballot. Uh, it only matters for those local elections where your election district really dictates who your representative is, let's say for city council or a school board election or some other smaller municipal body. So uh, those two, those two uh, provisions of, of Arizona's voting laws will be uh, reviewed by the court this term, and I believe in fairly short order, this um, grant of certiorari comes from a 239-page uh, a long opinion issued by the en banc court in the Ninth Circuit, meaning the full court heard this case, issued this 239-page decision, and uh, there were uh, very fervent dissents in this case, so we can understand why the court thought it was likely important to uh, resolve this uh, issue. But what's important, uh, I think, to raise in this case is that the majority of the judges on the Ninth Circuit went through great lengths to explain the, in exacting detail, the history of voter suppression against African American, Latinx, and Native American voters in the state of Arizona. We know that in particular, Native American voters are often residing in places that don't have street addresses and they don't have the same access to deliver their ballots to particular precincts. We know that there's a history of voter discrimination against Latinx and African-American voters in that state. And section two of the Voting Rights Act is going to be a, a key player in how the court determines this issue. And many may know already that section five of the Voting Rights Act was uh, suspended after the court decided in 2013 that the test to trigger that provision that protects against racial discrimination in certain jurisdictions of this country was outmoded. And Congress has been pushing to update the Voting Rights Act since it's been stalled in Congress. But section two has been viable. It's been the fail safe of the Voting Rights Act. And there is a concern that this case may tee up uh, this provision of the statute which would leave it completely gutted if for some reason uh, it, was up, it, was, it was found to be unconstitutional, but that this may tee it up for a very conservative Supreme Court to take aim at this critical crown jewel of the civil rights movement. So there are many reasons to watch this case, not only because of the direct implications it has for voters in Arizona, but for what it pretends for this all important statute that protects the quality and integrity of our elections across the country. Now, you gave me a great segue, Janae, because as I ask you all your uh, pick for the last term, I was going to ask you all for your pick for this term. Janae, you just gave us yours. Those, uh, those grants were made just Friday, which was really officially the start of this term for this court when they granted those orders to hear these cases. Uh, and I, I, I noted that case as sort of my big note from the seven that they decided to hear on Friday. So that case will be heard this term. Uh, Dean Morrison, I know we're going to lose you because you have a class to teach in ju just a few moments. Uh, I'd love to just ask you, what's the class and, and, and what are you teaching? But that's, that's not this panel tonight. Federal courts. I'm teaching federal courts, of course. Oh, Fed courts. Man, that was a hard class. Uh, <laughs> but if I'd had you, Dean Morrison. Uh, so what is your pick? What case are you watching? Is it, is it Obamacare slash ACA back for the fourth time? Or is it some other case that's maybe off the radar for everyone uh, this 2021 term? 
Well, uh, you got me. The one I was going to mention is uh, California against Texas or Texas against California consolidated. These are the cases involving um, the latest challenge to the Affordable Care Act, um, which will be argued the week after um, Election Day. Yeah. Uh, I'm certainly not alone in, in watching this. Um, I will say, because you're right, I do have to run to teach in a moment. Um, the, the question in the case here is whether the constitutionality of the minimum coverage provision or the individual mandate, um, uh, whether the answer to that question is now is different now that the Congress has basically zeroed out the tax that someone must pay in return for um, the tax that one must pay if they don't uh, purchase um, qualifying minimum insurance. Um, the court's already held that that provision is a constitutional um, exercise of Congress's tax power. Now the question is, is, is the answer different now that the tax is zero? And if the answer is different, it, is the entire statute um, subject to being struck down or can the unconstitutional minimum coverage provision be severed from the rest of the statute? Um, these are on the one hand, quite important sort of technical questions on the severability side, um, but I'll, I, I'm, I'm generally reluctant to make predictions, but here I'll make one. Um, I believe the court will not strike down the statute as unconstitutional, and I, I believe that it will not be a close vote. Um, the argument in particular that the Justice Department has made uh, for inseverability here um, and for unconstitutionality of the provision are um, uh, not the sort of arguments that would uh, receive high grades in my class or any other that I'm aware of. And um, I don't believe that with Judge Barrett on the court or with Judge Barrett not on the court, that this is going to be a close question. Um, in some senses, that therefore, uh, the argument that, um, that is being made in, in democratic circles as part of the presidential campaign and other campaigns this fall, that the future of the ACA lies in the balance. It's true in the sense that the, Obama, the uh, Trump administration is arguing uh, that this statute ought to be struck down. Um, but I will be very surprised indeed if that's the decision the court takes. Before I run, let me give you a case that's not on the court's docket, but might be there soon, not by way of certiorari, but by way of direct appeal. The census is back. It's still in litigation. Yes. It's now in, um, there's multiple cases. There's one in front of a district judge in California. There's one that's now in front of a three-judge panel here in New York. Um, the three-judge panel um, includes two judges from the Second Circuit, and the federal district judge, Judge Furman, who heard the census case the first time around, that ended up going up to the Supreme Court in which the court, in a majority opinion by the chief justice, held that um, the Trump administration had not provided uh, a, a truthful reason for why um, the citizenship question was going to be um, uh, added to the census. The question now is whether, even though there's no citizenship question in the census, may the Trump administration um, direct that the process of apportionment that follows after the gathering of the census information be, be done on the basis of citizenship? Um, and a whole lot of technical questions around whether that can be brought now. Is that challenge actually right, uh, et cetera? Uh, are there some aspects of it that might be moot if the census stops um, as it was originally scheduled to stop? How does this case interact with the case out in California? But the decision of the three-judge panel here in New York is directly appealable to the Supreme Court. And so it may end up on the court's docket much sooner than later. And just as you run out the door for our audience, direct appeal as opposed to certiorari? So rather than going through first a one-judge district court, then court of appeals, then a petition for certiorari, which the Supreme Court can grant or it usually does reject, a direct appeal can go straight there and... The court um, would typically note probable jurisdiction, and it would be much harder for the court to avoid hearing the case, basically. Thank you so much, Dean Morrison. Your students await you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see all of you. All right. I do have some questions here from the audience that I will uh, ask, if you don't mind. We got a big shout out for you, by the way, Janae. Kate Lawsman, who's in our audience, says, Pay attention, exclamation point, to Ms. Nelson, exclamation point. <laughs> so thank you, Kate, for that note. And we are paying attention. How could you not when Janae Nelson is speaking? I, I was paying attention to a text from my wife. I'm sorry, I looked down at my phone. 
<laughs> well, that's important too. <laughs> that's I, important, I, yes. <laughs> I have a question here that says, with all that is happening concerning, this is from Hector Soto, with all that is happening concerning voter suppression, the criminal justice system, bias, gerrymandering, and stealing of Justice Ginsburg's vacant seat, that's my, not my editorial, I'm just reading what's written here, uh, has the U.S. forfeited its right to call itself a democracy? I'm going to throw this to bo both of you, but, you know, let me start actually first with you, Ilya Shapiro, because, you know, what you said earlier really struck me as true, that there's a real lack of faith in our institutions, uh, not just our executive, not just our Congress, which we know gets the lowest rating even after journalists and lawyers, but also our judiciary. And this is really gravely concerning because we can't have a democracy that is functioning and robust if the citizenry has no faith in our three branches of government and in our fourth estate and in our institutions writ large. What are your thoughts with regard to Hector's comment? Well, I, I would quibble with some of the underlying premises uh, to the questions and we don't <laughs> have time right. for, a whole, for a whole panel on that. Uh, what I would say is uh, the the reason we have these cataclysmic fights every time there's a Supreme Court vacancy, whenever it happens, even if it's not a month before an election in, in a presidential election year, is because, first of all, we have the centralization of power in Washington. So the court decides very important, powerful things. Uh, and the culmination of several trends where different theories of interpretation map onto partisan preferences at a time when the parties are more ideologically sorted than they've been since at least the Civil War. So uh, there's no way to avoid these fraught debates about, uh, about these, these powerful seats. And that's why, uh, if uh, you were to ask me uh, the case that I was looking at for next term, um, uh, for the term that just started, was argued yesterday uh, and it goes to democracy and it goes to trust in the judiciary. This is the case out of Delaware, Carney versus Adams, where Delaware is unique in having a rule that to be on one of the top three courts, the state Supreme Court, the Chancery Court, very important for commercial law in Delaware, uh, and, and the other big one, um, you have to be, first of all, a member of a major, of, of one of the major parties, Democrat or Republican, and none, neither of the major, major parties can have more than a bare majority on the court. So they have to be three to two or four to three. There's a very interesting challenge uh, about whether that violates the rights of freedom of association, of speech, of independence, socialists, libertarians, anyone who doesn't want to be a D or an R. Uh, now, based on how the argument went, it looks like the court is questioning whether Mr. Adams even has the right to be in court, his standing, as lawyers say. Mm -hmm. But I think questions like that, the composition of the judiciary, how we got to where we are, uh, are very important. And, and you know, thankfully, at least the judiciary, even though its re respect for it has uh, gone down, it still is significantly greater than for Congress or the presidency or most other institutions. Though that's not saying a lot, so you have a long way down to go. Uh, Janae, how about it? Faith in our institutions as a foundation for our democracy. I think it's absolutely critical that we have faith in our institutions. And I think what we've seen over the past several months, if, if we were listening, uh, is that there is a growing number of Americans and residents of this country who whose faithlessness is increasing dramatically. Um, and we're seeing this across, uh, you know, the, the, the racial and ethnic spectrum. We're seeing it across generational spectrums. We're seeing it across even socioeconomic uh, uh, stratas. And, and that's extremely important for us to pay attention to. People like to cite um, Dr. King's statement or his analysis that, that riot is the language of the unheard. But there's a question that, that follows that. And he said, and, and what is it that America has failed to hear? And what we have failed to hear is that our residents, our community as Americans, we are becoming increasingly disillusioned with our institutions. And that is a recipe for democratic demise. So the question that Hector asks, you know, are we still a democracy? Can we legitimately call ourselves a democracy? I think we are really teetering on a very, very dangerous precipice here. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, a, a, a critical provision of the Voting Rights Act that's already disabled. Uh, we know that we really never became a legitimate democracy until the Voting Rights Act was passed just 55 years ago. 
1965, where we finally were able to bring all eligible voters into the electorate, at least in theory. And now we're, we're pulling back from those protections. We're uh, uh, pushing back against the Voting Rights Advancement Act, which would restore the protections that were lost and expand democracy. There are other pieces of legislation that would make our democracy far more inclusive and equitable. And those are not being implemented or, or passed and, and they're really being stalled quite forcefully. So it really does raise a significant question about our standing as a democracy. I, I don't think that we have turned an irreversible corner, but I think we are dangerously close and that we must pay attention. I imagine you would agree with Ilya that the courts are in better standing than the executive branch and certainly than Congress. I, I would say that's true, absolutely. Uh, and and you know that's our that's our forum, that's our arena, that's where we get uh, justice done in the courts. And even in this climate, even amidst uh, what is a, an alarming uh, packing of the courts in, in a way that is uh, deeply concerning in terms of the quality uh, and, and the extremist views of many of the nominees that have been uh, 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 affir- confirmed to the court, uh, we, we still are seeing judges take their oath seriously and meet out justice in, impartially in many instances, not all, but in many instances. And it's important that we keep that balance. It's in court, important that the courts remain depoliticized and that we have a, 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 a branch of government that is above this political fray. Uh, once it gets mired in, in this political morass, uh, it will be hard to imagine how we can get out of it, how anyone can have any faith in any of our institutions to lead us in the right direction for the betterment of all and not for a particular personal or political gain. I have a question from Emily. I'm going to toss it, uh, Ilya, to you. It comes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning about this political process we're going to go uh, into with regard to Amy Coney Barrett's nomination uh, and the voting in person on the floor of the Senate. Um, Hint, the opponents of the nomination she wants to know, let me just read it so I'm fair to her. If you need to vote in person, could the opponents not show up or delay the vote in some other way? Yeah, there are quorum rules for the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's 12 of the 22 members. It's currently split 12 Republican, 10 Democrats. So if uh, the Democrats boycott it, then all of the Republicans would have to show up to have uh, the hearing to have a quorum uh, on so the that's floor. The quorum, Ilya, in the Judiciary Committee. In the Judiciary Committee, yes. On the um, on the uh, floor, I believe the the quorum is a majority of senators, um, and it's tricky. It's it's unclear again what, if not all of the Republican senators show up and the Democrats are all absent. Uh, at least one and maybe two of the Republican senators have indicated they would vote no on Judge Barrett, at least before the election. Murkowski said that. Uh, Collins, I think, may have walked it back once Barrett was nominated. But anyway, it's tricky. Uh, The margin is now 53-47. And yes, the quorum issues and quorum games uh, are part of this, uh, you know, game theoretical uh, high stakes exercise that we're living. Mm, McConnell is so good at. And, and Janae, a very quick one for you about Chief Justice Roberts, who has become the main swing voter. Mm. Uh, if you know, he sided with the remaining four more, the four liberals uh, more often uh, than many would have expected him to. Now, if Amy Coney Barrett comes in to succeed the late Justice Ginsburg, he loses that pivotal presumably, if we can predict how she votes. Of course, you can't always, but he would shift into a different position, wouldn't he? There would be a solid conservative majority, wouldn't there? Yeah, the, the entire court will have shifted, um, you know, if, if uh, Judge Barrett is confirmed as a justice of the Supreme Court. And I think it will be imperative for Chief Justice Roberts uh, to think carefully about what the legacy of a Roberts court will be with this new dynamic. He still has sway, not voting power that can outvote any of the other justices, but there, he still has quite a bit of sway in terms of how he can shape the culture of that court, how he can shape um, 
uh, uh, the ways in which they interact and engage one another intellectually on a variety of issues. And I don't know that that will reposition him as a swing vote in, by any stretch. It's, I can't imagine it. It may depend on the issue. But we have reason to believe that Chief Justice Roberts does care about the reputation of the court to some extent. Um, and I, we can only hope that that will carry forward no matter who fills the vacant seat uh, and that the integrity of the court will still be of foremost importance for all of the justices on the court. Well, I want to thank you both very much for a wonderful discussion. Uh, Ilya Shapiro, director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute. Janae Nelson, associate director, counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. And of course, in absentia, uh, Dean Trevor Morrison of the NYU Law School. Have to say a thank you, even though he's not here, because in my heart, I'm always a law student. And this has been very elucidating to me in that regard. Thanks to you both. And I am so pleased to welcome back Sam Roberts. Jamie, thanks to you so much and to our panelists for that enlightening conversation. I feel like I've just been through a class at NYU <laughs> Law School. Please join Jamie and me again next Tuesday night at 5.30 when Debate Defends Democracy from Federal Hall will focus on race reconstruction and voting rights. Jamie is especially qualified to lead that discussion. She has a new role at WNYC senior editor for the station's newly created Race and Justice Unit. For more information on the program, to register, and for details on the Federal Hall Conservancy's plans for our new day at Federal Hall, please visit us at federalhall.org. Good evening.